we have Åsa Regner. Åsa, are you with us? Yes, now I can see you. Åsa, you are the deputy executive director for UN Women, but I must confess, I don't know where in the world are you joining us from? Good morning, I'm joining from New York. Good afternoon in, in Stockholm and the Nordic countries, uh, but it's breakfast time here for me. Great. Now, good to have you here, Åsa. And you are actually situated not in Stockholm this time, as we usually have, but you are in Gothenburg, so even better. A uh, morning in Gothenburg from New York. <laughs> so uh, Good, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> that you know that we Gothenburgians take this very seriously if you, uh, if you uh, confuse us with, with Stockholm. But Åsa, obviously, it's good to have your insights a little bit around gender equality and, and opportunities for, for women in this just transition. So I will leave the, the stage and the screen uh, for you to reflect a little bit uh, around this aspect of just transition. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. And thanks uh, so very much to the Nordic countries and to the Nordic uh, partnerships in the Nordic countries, to the work that you and women is doing uh, uh, from New York, but also in all the countries where we are working. We are very grateful for, for that partnership. Uh, on this particular topic, which is uh, an enormous one and very important and I'm also very happy that Victor mentioned it, the connection between climate change and gender inequality. Uh, we <clears throat> luckily nowadays know much more than before and we know that climate change and gender inequality are arguably two of the greatest sustainable development challenges of our time. They are both, unfortunately, also lagging behind in relation to international agreements and goals. Uh, this combination, climate change and in gender inequalities, poses obviously threats to ways of lives, livelihoods, health, safety and security for women and girls around the world. And as many of you know, women represent a high percentage of people in poor communities and are often highly dependent on local natural resources for their livelihood. And poor women, marginalized women or women of minorities are often those who are hardest hit, hit by climate change and its effects. So I'll go through a bit of how this happens, but it's important to me to point out from the beginning that women are in many um, respects victims of bad change, but they are certainly also leaders of good change and should be seen as such. And I will come back to that. Agriculture is the most important employment sector for women in low and lower middle income countries. And I think this is an important factor to, uh, to have uh, when we go forward uh, in, this, uh, in relation to this topic. Women are to a large extent in many countries responsible for securing food, water and fuel. Yet women themselves have less access to natural resources uh, than men. They also have less access to men, than men to credit, agriculture inputs, land ownership, big issue. Women often are those who work the lands, but they don't own it. Uh, they also don't have the same access at all to decision-making structures, to new technology, as Victor was talking about, training and extension services that would actually help and enhance women's capacity to adapt to climate change and also be able to compete on emerging markets. During periods of drought and erratic, erratic rainfall, for example, women need to work hard, even harder to secure income and resources for their families. And this puts, for example, added pressure on girls who we see often uh, have to leave school to help their mothers manage the increased burden that women and girls are seen uh, or tradition traditionally have. So social cultural norms and childcare responsibilities also often prevent women from migrating or to seek refuge 
uh, in other places when a disaster hits. One can say that climate change is a threat multiplier, as I described. It escalates social, political, and economic tension in fragile and conflict-affected settings. And we can actually see that, for example, in the Sahel, in farmer-herder conflicts, we know that women are deliberately targeted because if you hurt or even kill a mother, that really uh, puts a lot of stress on whole villages and it also makes uh, the chance for children to survive much less if the, if the mother um, is killed and disappears. As climate change drives conflict across the world, women and girls face increased exposure, as I said, to all forms of gender-based violence, including conflict-related sexual violence, human trafficking, child marriage, and even killings. Uh, as well as other forms of violence. Women, as you know, despite all of these difficulties are also very good at organize to change these things. And women human rights defenders are actually also and even at particular risk of violence, especially when they ad advocate for climate related uh, issues. Um, UN Women uh, is responsible for the organization, let's say, of the world's biggest meeting for uh, women's rights issues every year at the UN. And this meeting is held every year in March uh, and is called the Commission on the Status of Women. So this year in March, during the Commission on the Status of Women, and those who participate are all the member states on ministerial level and lots of um, civil society, private sector and others. Uh, and this year, the Commission on the Status of Women addressed these issues as a priority, climate change and, and gender equality. And the discussions culminated uh, in the adoption of a call for action. Uh, agreed conclusions. And since we have a lot of participants here today from the private, private sector, I can perhaps give some of the examples of what this meeting called for. They ask, it asked the uh, private sector to promote and protect the rights of all women and girls relating to their enjoyment of a clean, healthy and sustainable uh, environment in everything that the private sector uh, can decide about or has influence on. It also uh, asked um, to expand gender responsive financing and investment in climate, environment and disaster related policies and programs. Uh, and a third example is that it asked that it carries out environmental and human rights due diligence, taking into account the guiding principles on business, business and human rights. And this call to action was followed by the UN General Assembly uh, declaring that a healthy environment uh, is a human right in July uh, 2022. Uh, and uh, earlier we heard uh, Sonia from UNEP or also talking about this groundbreaking uh, declaration today. Uh, next year's Commission on the Status of Women will be dealing with the uh, digital and technological gap that Victor was alluding to. So I invite you all to follow that meeting and its conclusions or to participate when possible. Um, I think this will also be very relevant to this topic. Now we are in the uh, Nordic countries in the Göteborg, Gothenburg, and we know that both gender equality and climate policies are high on the agenda in the Nordic countries, which we are very happy about from the UN side. All the Nordic countries have adopted ambitious climate mitigation targets. Uh, you are all experts requiring structural changes in most sectors and policy areas. Most women in the Nordic countries are in paid employment. The gender pay gap continues to narrow, although it's slow. Uh, and women have a high level of education, all of this compared to uh, the rest of the world. That said, we also know that much more uh, needs to be done to eliminate violence against women uh, uh, and, uh, and to remove occupational segregation, to mention a few observations in relation to gender equality in the Nordic countries. 
At the same time, the links between the two agendas, gender equality and climate change, have perhaps received less attention. For example, gender equality is actually not very explicitly addressed in the Danish, Norwegian and Swedish climate action plans. However, good news, uh, Iceland's climate action plan does acknowledge that climate change and climate action vary by gender. Also, Finland's climate action plan includes a gender impact assessment, and it does acknowledge that climate objectives and measures have differ differentiated impacts on male and female dominated sectors. Uh, and Victor again alluded also to this. The Nordic countries, through the Nordic Council of Ministers, also delivered a commitment during the Commission of the Status of Women, um, the meeting that I talked about in March this year, and they then pledged to bring the gender equality and climate agendas together. Uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers also reached out to the African Union for collaboration and, and exchange uh, of experiences between these two um, regional bodies, which is also something uh, that we heard before, the importance of connecting north, uh, the global north with the global south. Uh, and obviously, we, we look forward to working uh, on all of this, both with uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers and the African Union and all other regions at the COP27 coming up. A study in Sweden showed in 2021 that women believe to a greater extent than men that climate mitigation actions are important. We also know that women are more positive towards changing their own behaviors in terms of lower, lowering the residential electricity use, for example. Perhaps that has changed now to uh, include more, both women and men. Um, they were also more positive to uh, ideas on green investing, and they were also more likely to choose trains over airplanes uh, and to think about their own consumption. Women are also in this study more likely to support economic incentives um, uh, and uh, bans of products or services with a very high carbon footprint. We think from you and women's side that these are very interesting service and data, and we think we need more of that in the world to better understand how to ad advance the climate mitigation and adaption actions in a way which is consistent with the nexus of gender equality and climate agendas. So thank you for good examples, good data and a good debate. I said in the beginning that women are certainly not only uh, victims or, or um, uh, survivors in this context. Uh, they are certainly also leaders and they organize and they go forward and they put um, proposals on government's tables on uh, better legislation, etc. So I think that we collectively need to ensure that women do have equal opportunities to be the climate leaders and decision makers that they actually are and, al and already want to be. And it has also been proven, I mean, this is a rights issue, they have the right to be there, but it has also been proven that women's participation and leadership in climate, uh, in climate action actually make the work more effective and it does shift political agendas and resource allocation. We do have a long way to go to, sec to, to secure women's participation in decision making. Globally, only 15% of ministers and our environmental sectors were women-led in 2020. Uh, and that was an increase from 12% in 2015 as one example. There are more examples. Um, so before I close, I also wanted to invite you to two initiatives that you and women has taken. Uh, if you haven't already, I wanted to draw your attention to something called the Women's Empowerment Principles, which is a blueprint for the private sector for ending discrimi discrimination on the basis of um, gender and to provide women with secure, decent jobs and uh, fair and equal chances uh, to take on um, senior leadership positions, not least 
important in when we talk about climate change and climate decisions going forward. 7,000 business, le uh, business leaders across more than 150 countries have already adopted these women's uh, economic empowerment guidelines, or principles, sorry. Also, UN Women has an initiative called Generation Equality. That is something we started because we saw that uh, um, gender equality was implemented far too slow in general all over the world. And within that initiative, there are six action areas for more action. And one of those areas is climate justice from a gender perspective. You are all invited to join that work and to support the actions that private sector governments and civil society agreed upon to push this agenda forward. Thank you so much for having me and uh, I hope you'll have a very nice Fika now. I'm very envious. Thank you. Thank you, Osa, for joining us this morning from, uh, from New York. Uh, 